the other day I was working from home. I was sitting at the kitchen table at my office and my son Ethan comes up to me and he says, Mommy, one time I sat it too long and it hurted my leg. Well, I thought that was a pretty clever way of getting me up away from the computer and I decided it was probably time that I put my work away and take him outside. But then I started thinking, maybe I shouldn't be taking him outside. Maybe I should be giving him an English lesson. He said, Mommy, one time I sat it too long. You know, there's a few gra grammatical mistakes here. But then I also started thinking about all the time I'd spent with Ethan this last year. And I started thinking, what if I end up talking more like Ethan? Can you imagine? I'm on a Zoom call with a bunch of other neuroscientists, and here I am. Um, excuse me, one time I sat it too long and it hurted my leg. I think it's time we take a break and go outside. But I don't think you need to be a neuroscientist to know that no, even if you spend 450 straight days with a kid who hasn't quite mastered the English language, no, you will not end up speaking like him. But the question is why? Why is it that Ethan will end up talking more like me and I'm not going to end up talking like Ethan? Well, it all comes back to the brain and how the brain develops. You've probably heard that the brain of a kid is like a sponge. A sponge, if you leave it on the table or with some spilt water, it, the properties of the sponge are such that it will just soak up the surrounding water. And the same is really true for Ethan. I don't have to teach Ethan English. I don't have to teach him languages. If he's exposed to languages early on in development, he's just going to soak it up. Now this is really because of our brain's ability to change in response to our environment. And this process of, of our brain changing in response to experiences is something known as neuroplasticity. Now my interest in neuroplasticity goes above and beyond my three children. In a non-pandemic year, you see, you would find me not only nurturing my three children, but you would find me in a research lab. My name is Marion Van Horn, and I'm a research associate at McGill University. I work in a research lab at the Montreal Neurological Institute, where I ask questions like, how? How does the brain change in response to experience? And the million dollar question, what properties of the developing brain enable it to be so susceptible to change compared to the adult brain? And so I, I started by telling you that the brain is like a sponge. And I think that's a really good analogy, but I've looked at a lot of brains under the microscope and I can confidently tell you that the brain is not a sponge. If you look under the microscope at a brain, what you'll see is the brain is filled with billions of nerve cells. Nerve cells, which we call neurons. So neurons are in our brain when we're born, we have billions of them. And these nerve cells, these neurons, they grow. They, they have branches and they're actively growing, they're exploring, they're dynamic. And what these neurons are doing is they're looking to communicate their information with a neighboring neuron, with a partner. So they're looking for their, their partner to make a connection. And when they make this connection, which is known as a synapse, this is where they can transfer information. Now, early during in development, when we're young, we have so much learning to do. And this, at this point in time, our brain is making tons and tons of synapses. We've seen that the brain goes kind of crazy and makes more synapses than it actually needs. Kind of like at the beginning of a pandemic, when everyone go, rushes out and buys way more toilet paper than they actually need. The brain is similar. It's making way more synapses. And eventually, there are just too many synapses. And so the brain has to decide which synapses to keep and which ones to eliminate. And we know through research that it's synapses, that these connections that are stimulated, that get strengthened. And those that aren't used get pruned away, get eliminated. And so, the brain is filled with these billions of neurons making connections, making synapses. But when I look under the microscope, there's more. There's more to the story. 
Our brain isn't just filled up with neurons, even though they've received a lot of attention. And we've done a lot of research trying to understand how neurons communicate. When I look under the microscope, and when others look under the microscope, we see more. We see that there are also glial cells, another type of cell in the brain that has received a little less attention. They were discovered over 100 years ago, and they were named glia. Glia in Greek means glue. And that's what we thought for many, many years. It's just that the glial cells were in the brain, holding the brain together, acting as support cells, the glue of the brain. Well, now our techniques have advanced, and we've been able to look at glial cells more closely. When we look at glial cells under the microscope and we study them, we see that they are also very active. They're dynamic. They have processes that are growing and exploring the environment, too. They interact at synapses. They talk to neurons. And so they release substances, substances like B-serine, which we have found is a very important molecule for strengthening synaptic connections. Researchers have also discovered that D-serine and other molecules that are released from glial cells can become dysregulated in certain neurological and neurodegenerative diseases like schizophrenia and depression and Alzheimer's disease. So we really need to keep studying these glial cells to figure out what molecules they're releasing and what role they play in learning and memory and neuroplasticity. There's another type of glial cell that we've started to study recently that's just really cool. They're called the microglia. And when we look at microglia under the microscope, what we see is these microglial cells are in the brain and they're actively exploring, surveying the brain. And what we've seen is that these, glial, these microglial cells will come in and they start nibbling at synapses. So we think that these microglial cells are really involved in the process of the elimination, getting rid of synapses that are no longer needed. And so that's really cool, right? That you have these cells that are getting rid of synapses. But it, I know what you're thinking. That's also kind of creepy. You've got these cells that are moving around in your brain, nibbling at synapses. I try not to think about that too much. And so what this tells us is that we need to keep studying these cells. And recently, very recent studies have shown that these microglia cells, for example, are more active during sleep. And so we've known for many years, we know that sleep is really important for learning. We know that we need to get good sleep. If we're sleep deprived, we can't learn anything. And so we're starting to understand some of the processes that are involved in, in, in learning. And that when we sleep, these microglial cells are coming in and they're involved in getting eliminating synapses. And so we have a better idea that sleep is really important for the reorganization of the brain and setting these neural pathways. And so for me, as a mother of Ethan, what I know is not only does Ethan need to be exposed to a stimulating waking environment, that I need to have active conversations with him and bring him outside so he, ever, he sees stimulating sights and sounds, but also that I need to make sure that he's getting the recommended amount of sleep because there's so much going on behind closed eyes. And so we have come a long way Techniques and advances in science are happening every day. Researchers collectively are coming together and we're making discoveries and we're finding out new things about the brain every single day. And so what it tells us is we need to keep studying the brain because we're learning more. And what we know for certain is that the brain does change. The brain changes in response to our experiences and in response to our environment. And so if you do think back at your childhood, you can get a better understanding of how your brain was customized. And you can start asking questions about your brain. And if you do want to learn something, if you do want to change something about your behavior, know that neuroplasticity, this concept that your brain can change in response to an env your environment, it still happens in adulthood. It just takes a little more time and effort and to be honest, it can be a little uncomfortable. But I have to tell you, I think this is a really good thing because at the end of the day, we don't want to end up talking like Ethan. Thank you. <laughs>